<laughs> All right. Good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am your host, Krista Porter, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly webinar series where we cover a variety of topics that be of interest to libraries, um, both here in Nebraska and across the country. Um, we broadcast the show live every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time. But if you're unable to join us on Wednesdays, that's fine. You can't, we do record the show every week and you can go to our website anytime you want to and watch our, our recordings. And I'll show you at the end of today's show where those archived recordings are available. Both the live show and the our, um, archives are free and open to anyone to watch. So please do share with your friends, family, neighbors, colleagues, anyone who you think might be interested in any of the topics any, that we've had on the show. Uh, and we do a mixture of things here, uh, book reviews, interviews, uh, demos of services and products, mini training sessions, basically anything that um, would be something inter of interest to libraries. Um, as the um, Nebraska Library Commission is the state agency for libraries here in Nebraska, uh, and that is for all types of libraries in the state. So you will find shows that are really, that are for public libraries, academic, K-12, schools, um, correctional facilities, museums, even anything that has a library or we can kind of think of it as a library, we're kind of open to that, just not have much of a definition, uh, it, we, there would be something on the show for you. Uh, we do bring in guest speakers sometimes from outside of the Library Commission and outside of Nebraska, but this morning we have one of our own staff on the show with me today. Uh, next to me here is um, Amanda Sweet, who is our Technology Innovation Librarian here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Good morning. Good morning. And happy Halloween. It, happy is, it is Halloween today. Um, I don't know if you did anything for... Yeah, more <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm doing a little Doctor Who. Uh, I have a little Doctor Who, the new Doctor Who cosplay. She has her son, a screwdriver. Um, so, um, not really anything related to Halloween in this show today, but just a little scary. Yeah. It's not. It won't be scary. <laughs> That's it. Yes, this will not. It will make it so you're not scared of it anymore. Oh, we That's something you have to. So yeah, I'm going to talk about. Teaching digital literacy in your library. So I'll just hand over you to take it away and tell us everything you need to know. No pressure. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so digital literacy kind of runs the gamut here. I run into it a lot when I teach courses in the library, when I go out and teach makerspace stuff in the library. Mm -hmm. And the big, huge question that I always get is, what is it? Because you hear that phrase all the time. Yeah. yeah. And it's a trick question because <laughs> it's different for everybody. It's going to be different mm -hmm. for every library that you go into and for each person that you talk to. So you may actually have come across it under any number of these different terms, new literacies, literacy and technology, uh, multi-literacies, pretty much anything. Every single new paper that comes out or every year they have some new definition for it. Somebody does new research and wants to come up with their name for it. Pretty much, yeah. But at the core of it, it's basically just learning different devices, finding out how to find information using those devices, and using that information safely. Mm. And then sharing it in a way that fits for you. So this is the long and the short of it. This presentation isn't going to be able to tell you everything there is to know about digital literacy in 15 minutes. That's <laughs> virtually impossible. But what I am going to do is give you a starting point. It'll give you a way to just bite off a little chunk of it and give you some actionable steps that you can take in your own library and give you some free resources to use to just grab and go mm -hmm. without having to take time that you definitely don't have to set up to find all these resources. Right, yeah. yeah. You've done that part for you. Pretty much. So this is actually what we're going to cover here today. I already did a little snippet of what digital literacy is, but each one of those little puzzle pieces that you just saw 
I'll give you some examples of what that actually is, and then I'll dive into some different resources that I scoured the internet to find for you to use in your own library. And then we'll kind of dive into what you can do to try to decide what you actually want to teach in your library. What are people interested in? And is this something that your library patrons are actually going to go attend? Yeah, there's a lot of those um, social media thing, services and products that your people just don't use. Right. And that's yeah. what you've got to find out. Yeah, yeah, don't teach a class on something that nobody in your town is interested in. And you can't force people to want to learn something. <laughs> like, sometimes I wish you could. <laughs> you know, trick is sometimes just ease people into it. But we'll get to that soon enough. And when you find out the breadth of information that's in here, you'll realize that one library doesn't have the resources or the time to teach everything to everybody. Mm -hmm. So there is an option of partnering with local organizations. Mm -hmm. So I'll touch on that toward the end here. So let's dive in. First off, there's a lot of digital literacy information for teaching how to use information for kids. Mm -hmm. And for, but there's not a whole lot for the parents that are out there right now. And, or for the elderly or for all different age groups. Because digital literacy isn't just for kids. It's great, they need to know it. But they also have, schools are also touching on that. Right, that's, I was wondering if that's the kind of thing that at a, a school that you'd want to be doing. It's probably oh, part of that, definitely. Yeah. But at a public library, depending on what your school is doing, you might be able to do less. Right. And or is that one of those where you could partner with them? Definitely, yeah. yeah. And being able to partner with different museums, different mm -hmm. schools, and make working, having the library communicate with the school to make sure you're not doubling up on information and that you're covering the things that you need to cover. And for schools to be able to funnel kids to the library, one, to get them through the door, and two, to get them the information that they need in a good, hands-on, attentive way. And that's another thing that I'll cover is project-based learning. People learn by doing. It's not just kids that learn that way, it's everybody. And that's not the only way to learn, but it helps. And any little thing that you can do to get this digital literacy across, it helps. So even if you put handouts and different posters up on your wall about digital safety and how to prevent cyber attacks and different things like that, people look at those. Mm -hmm. Like if you put them in the adult section, put them in the kids section, anything helps. So that first puzzle piece is learning digital devices. And there's a lot of them. Probably the most popular one is desktop computers and laptops. And then after that is smartphones. So even if you just focus on those three things, if people learn how to use those three and learn them really well, that's an amazing starting point. You don't need to do everything in your library. Just find out what your community actually uses, focus on that, and put your resources toward that. Mm -hmm. So, and there's also already some free resources together to help you do that. So this is digitalliteracy.gov. Yes. And I love this website. <laughs> and this will give you some pre-made lesson plans on how to teach basic computing. So you don't have to go through and set up your own stuff everywhere. Um, you can actually just go through here and this will give you like a good place to start to find out what to teach. And a lot of them, a lot of these resources will actually give you a step-by-step -step lesson plan, just mm -hmm. like this one. 
That's awesome. I've, I've referred a lot of people to this, yeah. I recognize the, the GCS. Right. Yeah. Good, good, goodwill, something, Community Foundation, is that what it sounds like? Yeah. yeah. And let me pop back in here. Next time I'll remember to open a new channel. <laughs> and this is actually one of my favorites here, um, Brain Pop. So this will give you more information about um, cloud computing is a really big one right mm -hmm. now. So I'm actually using running this presentation on Google Slides, right. and that's cloud computing. Mm -hmm. um, people don't necessarily know a ton about what cloud computing is. It's just this mythical thing in the sky that rains <laughs> down data. But We've done some Encompass Live shows about it, so check our yeah. archives. We yeah. can search our archives for that. But this will give you a whole lot of information about it. It gives you a little short video, and yes. then you can quiz yourself to make sure people are absorbing That's the like, I like that, that self-testing. Yeah. 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 You and can watch something all you want, but did you retain it? Right. Yeah. And it's great. It's self-paced, and you can just give people this link, and they can click around to learn more about what they actually want to find out about. And I like that it also had um, on the main page of all of the different ones basic things like computer mouse. Yeah. And we have so many people that drives. come in. Yeah, flash drives, data storage devices, thumb drives, things like that. Some people who are, one of our staff was just talking downstairs about it. Um, um, their elderly mother is like 80 years old. They got her computer. And that's the end. She's like, I've never touched one before. I don't know. I'm like, don't worry. We got it. And you've got to explain to them this is the mouse and what it does. For some right. of us, we've had one our whole lives. And it, it's not. Take it for granted. Yeah, we know what to do. And to them, if they've never bothered to use it before, never needed it, they didn't realize she needed to communicate with her grandchildren. So they got her writing letters on it and letters to her email. You know. <laughs> um, and but it what you have to start yes. with here's a mouse and what it does and how you click it yeah and this just gives you the long and the short of everything and your library doesn't have to put this together because it's, it's already, already there. there yes yeah. and let's pop back in here again And this one, Google actually, I won't go through mm -hmm. this because it'll make me log in for my account and mm -hmm. that takes more time than I need. Let's see, it's free of the Google account. Yeah. yeah. But this is actually something that Google put together to, it's a step by step lesson plan that's in their built in platform mm -hmm. that'll show people what the device is and how it works. So they're your basic Android phone and the Chromebook that they make. Mm -hmm. I should tell you, I should mention since we started going to these, don't worry about trying to um, scribble down these URLs or what these pages are. You're going to have access to these slides after the show. So right. it will yeah. all be included for you in the archive afterwards. So don't worry about trying to write down all that you've gotten there. You'll have a link to this later, and you'll be able to go to them right from that. And I merged it into a handout, too. So mm -hmm. it's just Thank on Wikipedia. Yeah. So, yeah. That's all. <laughs> Now, next is after people learn how to use the device itself, now they know how to use the computer, they know how to use the phone, what do you do with it? You learn, you have, you, there's a ton of digital tools that are out there, but before you can use them, people need to know they exist. So this is just a starting point. There are different Social media is a huge one in libraries right now. People want to learn how to use Facebook. They want to use how to use, learn how to use Twitter and everything mm -hmm. like that. Snapchat, Instagram, right. whatever their kids are using. Yeah. <laughs> and it's great to teach it for personal use, but it's also awesome to teach to show them that it can be used for professional development too. Mm -hmm. So, and that's another huge thing with digital literacy is that this is definitely not just for kids. Adults can further their career and they can do a lot more with their lives if they have these tools available to them. And that's why I always put a huge focus on digital literacy is for everyone. Mm -hmm. 
And a lot of them, they're going to be using it, like you said, in their career. A lot of um, businesses and organizations are going with cloud-based things as, as everything. Like right. Google, is, we're using Google. End of the story. That's yeah. going to be your email. That's going to be where you put your presentations like this, all of your documents. That's where you need to share and collaborate with your coworkers. And you need to know what that's all about exactly. before you go in to interview for that job. Right. That's not the kind of thing they want to have to teach at this day and age for someone going into that kind of place. You have to teach them what you get when you get there. You should already know. Right. And that's another thing that the Goodwill does is they do professional development, and that's why they have all those resources out there that show people how to use computers, they show them what it is, what they need it for, how to use it. And the more you know, the more you can do and the further you can go. Mm -hmm. And just so I don't take a full ton of time on this, we'll just move forward here into some examples of how different tools that you can use to teach. So I'm not sure how many people are familiar with the idea of blended learning, mm -hmm. but it's basically a combination of um, hands-on physical learning and computer learning. So an example would be if you're in a classroom and you have different stations set up in the classroom. You would have some kids that are working on the computer itself, they're researching information, they're looking it up. Then you have another little station over here of people that are using the information they just learned. Maybe they're, you're learning about a historical figure and then you're putting together a poster presentation to show how it works. So you will learn it, you use it, you absorb the information, and you go a lot further that way. So this is a whole slew of information about different learning management tools that you can use. Uh, one of the most popular mm -hmm. ones on here, Kahoot. <laughs> Kahoot is, it's basically like a little interactive um, quiz style thing. So it's colorful, kids like it. They get engaged into it, and you can teach them snippets of information and then quiz them to find out how well they absorbed it, and then find out what you need to focus on later on. The mm -hmm. used in a lot of classrooms. I actually ran into it on EdWeb, and EdWeb is more geared toward schools and school libraries, mm -hmm. but regular libraries can learn That's a lot of good, yeah, yeah, just yeah, educational some, yeah. concepts in, in general, yeah. Yeah. So just because it's got education on the label, that really doesn't mean it's only for schools. Libraries can do a lot of education too. So this is just a little a fun site to sit through and find out if there's something that you might be interested in diving into. Well, I've certainly heard a lot of some people talk about using Padlet too. Oh, uh, yeah. One there. Yeah. I've heard of that one. That is really popular right now. You know, like, a, like I said, a virtual wall, wall, an interactive thing where multiple people, multiple students and yeah. teacher can be posting yeah. things together. A lot of collaboration going on. Yeah. And it also teaches uh, forums. So, um, yeah. And it's great to get kids introduced early to how forums work. It's basically just a sharing of information and ideas. And so for example, for a forum for a basic computing class, it, you can do a lot of peer-to-peer -peer learning that way. So someone in the class were to post a question and they would say, oh, I'm having trouble learning how to access this program in here. And another peer answers it. And then another one maybe gives a slight correction to that. You can teach how to do open access. You can teach how to do forum sharing and information sharing and how to do basically just help each other out. Mm -hmm. And it also is great for teaching ethics too. 
So, netiquette is something that I'm going to be covering a little bit about. Mm -hmm. And it's something that not just kids have these problems with, but adults too. Mm -hmm. But I'll dive into that a little later. It's one of my puzzle pieces. <laughs> and let's get in here. And this one is also great for digitalliteracy.gov put together a lot of tools for specifically designed for professional development. And wait, I'm done. There. So if you want to do a short series in your library about how to further your small business using digital tools, this is a great way to do it. And I won't click through all of these because we only have so much time. <laughs> <laughs> but this has just a lot of resources already put together that you can, again, just grab and go. Let me close that and go back here. And the last one I'll just touch on quickly here is the digital teacher. So this is run through Cambridge, um, Cambridge University. And this is a really, really, really enthusiastic teacher who loves to share what she does. And she's put together a lot of pre-existing lesson plans and you'll find a lot of cool stuff for ESL and for different digital tools to use in your library. And again, we definitely don't have time to dive into every one of these, but just so you're aware it's here, digitalteacher.com. Yeah, we do have a question about one of those, the um, what is it, getting smart? Okay. Okay. It wants to know, um, someone wants to know, does anyone have any experience using getting smart with adults. I've pointed people to it and, and I've worked with them when I've gone around to teach uh, makerspace stuff. It's worked pretty well for people. Yeah, because it's there we've been teaching adults like how right. to how to yeah. help run their makerspaces. Yeah. Yeah. And there is actually I just did kind of a quick search there. They do have some things using technology and motivation to um, to reach adult learners. So they do have resources on there and things for adults. Um, if anyone has used it in a course or a class or has, has um, experience using this, the Getting Smart website for um, adults, let us know, type into the section. But they, there are resources there for adults, so. Yeah, yeah. and I have pointed adults to it and they have used it and they have learned a lot. So it's been successful in the yeah. experience. <laughs> so close that and pop back in here. And searching and finding information is a big one. So if you work with any information literacy, mm -hmm. this is going to cross over a lot. And if you touched on fake news in your library, there's, this is also going to mm -hmm. play in there too. So this is just giving different exercises to people of all ages so that they learn to take a closer look at the articles that they're reading, at the news that they come across, and at various different websites. So it'll teach them to look at that domain name and find out if it ends in a .com or an .edu or a .gov. Mm -hmm. And then take it a step further than that and find out if that information is relevant to them, if it's accurate, if it's current, when was it published. And it, the big thing is just to get people to start asking themselves questions mm -hmm. and to not take everything at face value. So, and to find out that there is more than just Google. <laughs> you know? And that's okay. Yeah. Google is an okay, a good place to start, but yeah. we do have to go farther, yes. And I use Google every day. I mm -hmm. love Google. 
And but there's other stuff out there. There's open source databases, there's journals and encyclopedias and there's a ton of stuff out there. Verified resources. Yeah, not just yeah. random internet sites that you come across. Yeah. And so of course the first one I put on here is more advanced ways to search Google because people are gonna use Google. Mm -hmm. I use it, I love it. I will never stop using Google. But you have to know, as that says, are the right ways to use it. Right, yeah. Yeah. And this just gives you this I actually from this article I learned a bunch of stuff that I didn't know before. Um, some of this stuff is stuff I learned in library school that they just moved over into Google. <laughs> and some of it is just, it's just cool. <laughs> I like the excluding words one. Yeah. That you're yeah. looking for something on a topic and some of those phrases can bring up uh, incorrect, for, incorrect for you results. Right. Because yeah. it's also about something else and you can say, well, yeah, that, but not. I didn't want to know about that part, that thing, yeah. that's the same, yeah. Or if you need exact phrasing, but you need two separate phrases, but there might be a lot of terms in the middle, mm -hmm. there is also like quote and using the and as a mm -hmm. actor. I use quotes all the time. Yeah. To make, if you put a phrase in quotes, it will look for that exact phrase rather than just doing a Google search of a bunch of words, but we'll find all of them anywhere, in any yeah. place. It's yeah. just like chaos, <laughs> yeah. which sometimes is great when you're just kind of you know doing a feeler. But when you know I need this specific three-word phrase, quotes, boom, yeah, to get you what you need. Either. But using the minus sign in front of the word to exclude it is hugely helpful too. Yeah. So that's a good one to sift through there too. And I'll close that. Mm -hmm. Then we'll move on to. And Global Citizen is one that I go to a lot to it basically incorporate some um, ethics into your search too. Mm -hmm. And it incorporates, this will give you some really good tools for pre-made scenarios to present to students to get them thinking. So if I scroll far enough down here, there's actually a guide here. Um, it looks like this is the ad part of it. The, this is like a step-by-step -step guide for exactly what it says, mm -hmm. teaching online research skills. And it'll give you everything that you need to cover. And There's also a scrolling, scrolling, scrolling. Here. Additional list of resources and tips and tricks. This is what yeah. I was looking yes. for. So they've also already put together some additional resources that are related to the exercises that they put up to. So that helps. It's amazing how many different tips there are. As you can see there, there's like all those different, here's 10 tips, here's 36 tips. Yeah, here's the five yeah. best ones you should know. And mm -hmm. there's just so many things you can do. Exactly. And this is a, I clicked on the link at the bottom and it's an information fluency guide. So this will give dive a lot more into more specific lesson plans and after you fill this out i already i filled this out myself and i submitted it mm -hmm. and it gives you a pdf and that will give you different scenarios that you can present to students that are and it's separated by age range nice yeah mm -hmm. and you can either do it by age range or skill level it's free and it's great it's great, it's it's great. great. Yeah. Yeah, none of the resources in here will be paid in any way. I chose all free resources. And this was just at the bottom of the global mm -hmm. citizen. And 
real versus fake news. I searched around everywhere for different lesson plans that will show you real versus fake. Mm -hmm. And of course, my favorite one was on BBC. (laughs) (coughs) And this is actually just a straight up lesson plan. It downloads into a PowerPoint format and it's just a slideshow that you can show pretty much anyone. And then it'll give you kind of a did you absorb this kind of thing in the end? And it'll tell you as a librarian what you need to do to set people up. Oh, nice. Like, so that you can makes sense. paper that you can do. Yeah. And basically, BBC is such a bank. And moving right along, because we've got some ground to cover here. Mm -hmm. Digital safety is a huge one. Mm -hmm. Uh, So probably the most important ones on here, smartphone and app safety, phishing and email safety. Um, This is a big one for all ages, as is this one. But the resources that I put in here will show parents how they can monitor smartphone activity and how they can start a conversation with their kids to teach them safety. But before parents can teach the kids about safety, they need to learn it themselves. Mm -hmm. So in here, we've got how to be a good parent workshop. So Family Online Safety Institute is a nonprofit organization and they put together some, it's basically a pre-made, pre-built program that you can just download and they have different handouts that you can put out and they have information packets and you just fill out this form, download it, it'll send you over to a Dropbox account, and then you can open up some different PDFs and different PowerPoint presentations that you can show in your library. And there's also some leaflets and handouts that you can print out and just leave in a stack in the library as well. And then This is the one I want here. This is specifically for parents and for kids. So they set they set up these different interactive videos that they're actually kind of cool because there are these little animated snippets that It'll show up like a little virtual computer screen, and then it'll have people click on different things that they think might be a little bit suspect. And then it'll tell you why it was suspect and if it was or if it wasn't. Yeah. And then, and you can see in the example here, there's like a little email message or a text message that someone got, and the parent or the teacher or the student has to look at this and say, should I reply to this? Does this look like it's real or is it fake and should I tell my parent? Mm -hmm. And this will give information directly to parents. You can put students directly over here. And this is the handy dandy indicator guide that will give you a blow by blow of everything that's available in these videos so you don't have to watch them all yourself before you. Oh, cool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That, is, that can take a lot of time to look at what is actually in this thing that I'm, I'm sharing or providing right. yeah. to these parents and yeah. Really even, yeah. And I like that it's got separate, here's the one for a student and here's yeah. one if you're the parent. Yeah. You should, be, you should be watching this, these ones instead. And there's also later on down on this page is if you use the educator guide or if you use the parent. 
so much catching. <laughs> so this will just, this is like a little blinking light, but it just makes it interactive. And it tells you exactly where to go. And this is cut off a little bit, but it's a good place to start. So pop out of there and back in here. And for the sake of time, I'll skip over this one, but it's no, leading it back over to the other yeah. Mm -hmm. And copyright and plagiarism is a huge one. Um, they already do cover it a lot in schools because they have to. Mm -hmm. But copyright goes beyond just writing papers. Uh, a big thing is copyright in the maker movement. Um, so, for example, mm -hmm. we use audio equipment in the library right now. Mm -hmm. But there's fair use and there is just straight up copyright violation. And if you, so say for example, you're playing around with audio equipment in the library, you download someone else's song, and you decide to take out like a little snippet of it and replace your library name with it. Most people don't care. Mm -hmm. um, nine times out of 10, it's a library, you're not selling it, no one really minds that much. But people sometimes. like libraries. Yeah. Generally. Yeah. But every so often <laughs> you'll get that one artist or that one someone who comes across it and goes, We can't use this. And it's just it, sometimes the maker movement of um, using different equipment to make your own thing, it wants a fine line on the copyright. Mm -hmm. And some people care more about that than others. Odds are pretty good that in a random library in the middle of wherever you happen to be, you mm -hmm. don't care. Yeah, like, especially if you're just using it in your library and the, the kids or the teens are making their thing and they take it home and yeah, no one ever sees or knows about it. That's yeah, never going to know. But and they've learned how to do this cool thing. It's when you start sharing it outside of the library that it can get away. And it gets a little hazy when people come into your makerspace in the library, you show them how to do something, they take that, and then they make their own thing and then go sell it online. Mm -hmm. And then it turns out that what they're selling online, they may not have known it, the patron may not have known it, but they violated the copyright. Mm -hmm. They use someone else's work or they use someone else's song they sold it for a profit, violated a copyright, and it comes back to the library. So where they got it from originally. Yeah. yeah. And they the patron just goes, Well, I learned about the library. And that's where you run into some troubles. So by and large, ninety nine point nine percent of the time, we don't care. Like, but every so often. So it's just something to be aware of. It's not something you'll likely run into a whole lot, but information is good to have. And something that you need to make sure that anyone using your resources in the library like that are like that are aware that it's something they need to it's something they need to be aware of if right. they are gonna yeah. use it, that it's not up to us to police them and yeah. whatnot, but we can inform them and it's tell them this is the issue that you need to take into consideration before you decide to do whatever you're gonna do with this um, song mm -hmm. or this design from the from 3D printer or whatever. If you're just going to do it, take it home, make Christmas presents for your family, cool. Yeah. Um, but but it's when, when you, you start selling, selling it, that's yeah. where it comes in. That's where everything changes when you're selling yeah. it for your own profit. Yeah. And that's why to protect your library, writing a, a policy that covers you in mm -hmm. that is also a great way to go. And I think one of the big concepts is a lot of people are finding these, they're going online to find all these like plans for things. Right. And the whole key free is yes. Yeah. <laughs> and the whole concept that some people still have that, well, if it's on the internet, it's free. 
and I can use it for anything, right? It's out there for anybody to use. No, no, yes. it doesn't work that way. You need to double check and make sure that thing you found is not copyrighted by someone else. Yeah. It wasn't them saying, here's my artwork or my yeah. design, my original design, and I've copyrighted it. If you want to use it, you need to contact me. You know, you need yeah. to look for that information. As in that some people still have the whole, but I found it online. That means yeah. everything online is free and open to its kind. Hope it's not. <laughs> Just because you can doesn't mean you should. <laughs> That's a key, yeah. And so this is true for the things you make. It's true for the things you write. It's true for if you go onto an online forum or a wiki, and if you repost it onto your own site, mm -hmm. there have been people that got in trouble for doing that. So if you read the copyright laws, know the copyright laws, and know how to share things while still attributing it to the original author, right. that's Same a big thing. thing. Yeah. So, how do you teach it? Editopia is a big one. Um, I know I'm looking at the clock here, so I'm not going to click through all these. I'm just mm -hmm. going to give you an overview of what they are. Um, and basically, the title says it all for this one. It's a series of five minute videos that you can show in your library or in your school and your organization that gives people different information about it. Copyright, fair use, how it can be used in the library, how it can be used in various different locations. And you'll also see common sense education popping up a lot on these resources. And this is actually specifically for kids. It's different lesson plans and different activities that you can use with kids to show them the right way to go, build their moral compass, if you will. Mm -hmm. And plagiarism.org is, it teaches me about plagiarism. Mm -hmm. you know? There's, that's a long and a short of that yeah. one, really. <laughs> we have a question related to this um, about Creative Commons copyright. Oh, like um, the Raspberry Pi. Yeah, how yeah. does Creative Commons copyright issues add much to this? I mean, how does that creative, I mean, maybe just a short little explanation on what so, Creative Commons. So Creative Commons, you'll find in things like um, Arduino has a Creative Commons license. So SparkFun is, a, it, Arduino is a little circuit board that you can use to build various different things. They use a Creative Commons license so that other people can use their original source code to develop their own material. But they have to attribute their little spin-off thing to mm -hmm. Arduino itself. Mm -hmm. And each Creative Commons license will be written very specifically for guidelines for how people can use things. So something like SparkFun is another little circuit board that's that, that branched off of Arduino, but they had to run through the gamut to be able to say that this is branching off of Arduino, but it's something that we made that was, I guess, kind of an inspired by. Mm -hmm. So Creative Commons is another huge thing to teach in maker movement, especially mm -hmm. when people dive into things and they really get into it and want to make their own thing. Mm -hmm. And that way, later on down the line, as the aspiring technologist or the aspiring maker is doing their thing, they won't run into all these legal issues later on. And Creative Commons, there is a little snippet of it in the five minute film festival up here. So oh, they have one in there? Cool. Yeah. Or if you have I am not qualified in any way, shape, or form to be able to give you any legal advice on copyright <laughs> issues, but there are different places that you can go to to get specific legal advice on it. I'm just not going to disclaimer. Yeah. We, we did do an Encompass Live a show recently on fair use, I believe. Um, when you just look it up here, which is related to this, you know, what you can and can't use. Yes, the fac facets of fair use last August. So you look up fair use on our, on our archives, and I'll show you at the end of today's show about that. Um, 
So we've got a session on that. And I was just making a note to myself, actually, that I think we've done some things about Creative Commons, but it's been a while, and I'm going to do an update on that. It definitely needs to be done. Well, way too long ago. 2010, yeah, we're going to update that. <laughs> but Creative Commons is great. It's something that creators, um, makers of anything, yeah. um, you'll see it on websites, too, like... Um, uh, someone has, has designed the um, a lot of open access, like open access, yeah, yeah. Um, a WordPress theme or something. They'll say this is great or the content of creation, which me and you'll look and it'll tell you, you can use my stuff. And it's a way of actually sort of for creators to let let people allow them to let you to let you know that you are allowed to use it, but with these restrictions. Right. You can modify it, but make sure you you cite that you got it from me, or you can't modify it. it means you can copy it and just in whole and you keep it all together, right. but you also still gotta say this is where I got it from. And they've got these all rules, but yeah. it's something to look at when you're um, finding things online. Have they Creative Commons licensed it, and at what with what restrictions? Yeah, or is it yeah. And Chuck and Ride Along. Online presence. Think before you post. Oh, yes. Very important. <laughs> <laughs> and so this is great for, you can actually, there is such a way that you can start teaching kids how to build an online presence and build their own reputation so that later on down the line, they have a better shot at building a professional online presence. Mm -hmm. So if you know how to use Facebook, you know how to use Twitter, you know how to build your own website, or you don't actually need to know how to code to make your own website, you can use something like WordPress, and we use that in the library a lot too. Mm -hmm. And you can use that to build your online presence, and you can learn different tips and tricks for how to do it well. So, and this cute little troll dude. That's cute. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this will also go into the kind of the ethics and the netiquette. Mm -hmm. So now, so say you build a Facebook profile and you're starting to build an online presence. You are going online to show people who you are, what you're all about. You want to send a good message across. Mm -hmm. And the earlier on you can teach that, the better. And that's why I have this little award ribbon here for protect your reputation. Because it's not, this again is not something that just kids run into. It's across the board. So, how do you teach it? Again, Google. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, Google for education. I'm pretty sure that Google just knows all. <laughs> but they built a whole little module on here that has, I think it's between two to four lessons that will show people how to manage your online reputation. And again, I won't look at because we're running low on time. But, and then in the cyberbullying, mm -hmm. it's real. Yeah. But so, this is something that people just need to be more aware of. It's something that, it, it again gets you thinking. It'll go through like different resources to teach people what cyberbullying is, how to prevent it, how to raise awareness for parents, how to raise awareness in your organization. And basically if you show people, if you, post things that make other people feel bad, it has an impact. Mm -hmm. So this is the ethics of digital literacy. And the ethics of digital literacy is going to run through everything that you do and everything that you teach. So you're, with digital literacy, you're not just teaching how to use something or what you can do with it. You have to teach how to do it well how to build ethics, build a moral compass, and start it early. And again, Common Sense also has some great information on here. And I'll actually put this one because I like it. <laughs> so.
So this one, it's a set of kind of, um, they put together a whole ton of resources on here, which is why I like it. And this is actually different librarians who have been teaching it, who have been using it, who have done it, and they've been there. And they've done it way more than I have. <laughs> so, so this is one that I like. It'll give you a lot of information about it, and it'll give you digital literacy tools that you can actually use and just actively go forth and start doing it. And move on here. So now this is kind of where digital literacy is all leading up to. You've learned how to use the tools, you've learned how to use them correctly, you've, used, you've learned the different options that work well for you, you've matched up your, your own personal interests with the tools that exist and are out there. And now you've built your brand, you've built your online presence, you're telling people who you are and what you're all about. Now you wanna share your work. You've created this cool and awesome thing and now, it's time to tell people about it. Mm -hmm. So that's where things like podcasting and your website and Creative Commons also pops up here again too. Mm -hmm. But this will teach you how to, what you can do to be more effective in spreading the word. So, and I also put webinars up there and I don't have time for it. Hi. But so how do you teach it? The first two on here I put about netiquette and cyber ethics because they're huge. Um, I've already I don't want to beat this to the ground because I've already talked a lot about it, but those are two huge things that you run into when you're going into shared forms, going into open access. But this is the one that I like here. Why do we need open access? Um, the Right to Research Coalition, I love them. They put together a lot of different resources and they geared it toward different people. So, we want to, as a library, you'd want, or any organization really, you want to encourage people to know how to contribute to open access, tell them what it is, and tell them that it's a great free way to be able to spread information and spread accurate information that's peer reviewed or that's accurately reviewed. Mm -hmm. So, and showing that money isn't everything. Sometimes information is the best it's thing out there. Yeah. yeah. This is something that's been a, it's trying to switch the, the viewpoint, I guess, um, in more scholarly academic yeah. circles that this stuff has always been behind uh, paywalls or locked yeah. up and if you want to see someone's dissertation, you gotta contact that college yeah. and get them to give you a copy and you gotta pay them however much money mm -hmm. for it. And we're trying to switch the um, thinking on that, that no, this research and information should be available. Other people need to know about it as easily as possible to learn what's been yeah. researched and found out and to build upon it. And, and to keep not duplicate studies. studies. Yes, wasting yeah. time duplicating something yeah. that already, yeah. And you almost have to duplicate it because you can't access the first one. If you don't even know what's yeah. there. Yeah. yeah. Good. It's mosey on here. Mm -hmm. So this, I'm just going to briefly, briefly, briefly touch upon because it's how digital literacy is changing now. 
And I do, I mentioned in the beginning that every single year, every month, every time, (laughs) the definition for digital literacy keeps changing. Mm -hmm. But the cool thing is all these topics on here, they look like they're just out of this world, we can never do this. But that's not true. Mm -hmm. It actually fits, a lot of this fits into what I already talked about right now. Like augmented reality and virtual reality, they can just be different ways to teach. They Mm -hmm. can be just interactive ways that you could even teach digital literacy itself. And artificial intelligence we use all the time, everywhere, always. But people want to know more about all of this stuff. And libraries are starting to put a lot of programs for a lot of this different stuff out there. But the biggest thing is that no library on the planet has the time or budget to be able to teach all of this. No. So the big thing is what do you actually want to teach? I also like my little turtle there. Yeah. <laughs> and he's morality free. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but so before you decide what to teach, it helps to know what exists first. So all those digital tools out there, even if you just Google digital literacy tools, you can learn a lot about a good starting point. Or if you want mm-hmm. to look, refer back to even this presentation just for a starting point. I, again, I guarantee I did not cover everything. It's yeah, there's, there's a lot. And yeah. you can see just from all this, you know, I mean, just the previous slide, there's so many different things coming right. up. And the yeah. original slide back in the beginning listing all the things that digital literacy can be. Yeah. Um, it's a huge topic. But this, I think, yeah, you've got to figure out what do you, your people want. And then based on that, what can you, do you have the time right. to provide? And then... If you can't do it, where can you send them, like these places that already have the um, lesson plans? Oh, you need to know about that? We don't have a class in it, but here, go look at this. This will teach you everything you need to know. And there's also the big thing about teaching it in the library is what is your staff comfortable with, too? Mm -hmm. Because they all know them, too. Yeah. 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 And introducing things just a little at a time instead of throwing everything in all at once can go a long way. Because if you're, if the library staff isn't on board, then mm-hmm. the heart won't be in it, and it won't work quite as well. And your patrons will notice. Yeah. 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 And so once you find out what people want, like what your staff, what exists, find out what your staff is comfortable teaching, then ask the patrons. Find out what kids want to learn, what the elderly need to learn, what pretty much everyone across the board actually wants. Once you have a list of what people want, you can compare it against what you can actually do. And then pick the most important things from there. And that way you're choosing programs and building programs and putting resources into things that people will actually attend. And then you have a good way to justify continuing a digital literacy program because it's popular and people need it. And the people what they want. Right? (laughs) (laughs) And just because you as a librarian or you on or you and your organization, just because you're just learning some of this stuff and you may not be as familiar with it, doesn't mean you can't teach it. Sometimes the best way that I learned is while I was teaching it. Mm-hmm. And it's it's a little bit trial under fire, <laughs> but yeah. this is life. <laughs> and number six is also my favorite on here. Um, failure is the start of something great. I live by that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But let me know. Once you've started a digital literacy program in your library, and it doesn't have to be anything huge, it can just be just one or two things to start off with. And 
once you've started that, as you continue going, you start collecting information, collect stories, find out what people have done after they've gone to a session in your library. Mm -hmm. What have they, what have they made? Build sort of like a little library portfolio to show that people are using your services and that they are getting something out of what you're teaching. And it helps you keep going. It helps bring more patrons into the library. And instead of just posting these projects in the library itself, you can start doing outreach. You can go to state fairs, you can go to different schools in the area, you can go and show people what your library is doing and how it's impacting your, your community and how it's helping your community grow. And digital literacy is huge. Digital literacy is what you make it. It's what your community needs, it's what your community wants, and it helps bring people together. And instead of just teaching a one-on-one -on -one class, the project-based learning can also encourage teamwork too. So you can put more experienced people together with less experienced people. And putting, putting people together like that is, it's a great way to encourage growth. And it's a great way to spread resources. I think they like to help each other too. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's, it becomes a, it's a, it's a collaborative lot, but it, but they don't do it that way. It's just like, oh, this, you know, this kid doesn't get it, but I do, or this senior doesn't understand this, you know, older person, yeah. but you know, this other one does, and help them, and you know, it's yeah. a sense of accomplishment, and yeah, you know, and everything takes practice. Yeah, and everybody yeah. learns at different rates, and yeah. Some people may pick something up the first time they see it, and other people might need to do it five or ten times. Mm -hmm. it just, it's skill level, it's experience, it's comfort level, it's how much sleep you have that morning. <laughs> <laughs> All right, before we go on, I just want to say um, we are a little past our usual 11 a.m. Central Time end time, but. Um, that's okay. We started a little late today, too. And um, anyways, we will keep going as long as it takes to get through all the slides. Any of you who are, want to stick around, you can keep asking questions. And um, if you have to leave, that's okay. The whole show is being recorded, so you have that afterwards. And we did have a question somebody want to know about sending the slides. Um, yes, these slides will be available afterwards um, along with the archive recording. And you may have seen as um, we've been popping, um, may have been popping around, there is a handout put together as well with all these links that you'll have um, will send to you as, as well with all of the URLs and websites that were mentioned in the show. So you'll have all those resources afterwards too. And they're separated by category, so it should be cool. Easy, easy access. And so I'm almost done. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So this is just an example of the different organizations that you can partner with to be able to spread more information and to kind of network together and funnel people into different partner organizations, I guess you could say, so that it's not all just on the library and it's not all just on the school. So if you were to gather together your local community center, maybe a few museums in the area, and you grab your school library, get the school curriculum and your public library, find out what each person is covering right there mm -hmm. and share resources. So your library is not stressed out to the guilds trying to get all that done. And any little bit helps. That's pretty much it. <laughs> But if you have any questions either now or a little later on as you're trying to put this together, you know where I am. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and my contact info will also be on that handout should you need it in the future. Mm -hmm. Let's go ahead and show the handout since you had it. Yeah, yeah. up there, yeah. Okay, so if you have any, any uh, last minute questions you want to ask Amanda, go ahead and type them in right now. Oh, we have a comment saying, I'm loving all the resources you're sharing here. Thank you. For <laughs> um, so yeah, here's yeah, the. So this is just, yeah. yeah, and this will just give you a little mini description of what it is, and 
I put out the full link just in case you want to print it instead of mm. just clicking online. Otherwise, I would have just turned that into a link. But sure, because it is something you could potentially hand out to someone right. or yeah. whatever, and they might want to type in something. Yeah, yeah. And, and not I, always be an electronic version. Right, yeah. Mm -hmm. I learned that the hard way after yeah. the first time I presented something way back when. Um, yeah. Always make it so you can print it too. <laughs> you never know how people are going to want to use it. Yeah. That's true. And email is usually the best way to get a hold of me, but my mm -hmm. phone is also, I'd say it's online. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all of, our, all of our contact info is on the website. Yeah, that's true. But. Yeah. That was about the long short of it. Ah, okay. So on this one, no. Can they share this? This is asking you. Your creative. Your your sharing your restrictions of any. Can we share this handout with patrons? Sure. Would be something yeah. to share. Yeah. So I made it. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. It could be used. Um. Yeah. And, you know. Realize yeah. it is. You know. Just have that heading teaching digital literacy yeah. in the library. So, um. You might want to take this. Um, and modify it a little bit yeah. to be something that would be more, because like that heading there is going to be maybe a little confusing to a patron potentially. Yeah. So you might tweak this a little bit and, and maybe take parts of it to, might need description. Yeah, to yeah. make it more um, patron friendly or accessible, patron accessible, because some yeah. of this they may not you know. It could be a little yeah. daunting just seeing that yeah. heading, <laughs> like learning. Like, yeah, so you probably modify it potentially. Yeah, because this was created for librarians for or library yeah. staff. Um, but you could definitely tweak it and use yeah. parts of it that yeah. would be appropriate to hand out to someone. Yeah. Um, and some of these sites mm -hmm. also have pre made handouts that are specific to the category, too. Yeah. yeah. So dig deep, you know, drill down into their sites too to find things on, on specific on each of these topics. Because yeah, giving this whole handout to someone may they might, they, they might scare them. them. Yeah, <laughs> that's yeah. so much. Wait, after learning all these different things all at once, no, no, no. Like you yeah. said earlier, break it up into little pieces when you're learning it, yeah. or when you're presenting it to your staff. As here's something we all need to start learning. Yeah, you you get to break it up into small. Bite-sized bite pieces. Size pieces so they don't choke on it and run away scared, screaming. Pretty much. Yeah. It's Halloween. We're trying to make it a not yeah. scary. Digital literacy <laughs> is not scary. I promise. Yeah. You can do it. Your staff can do it. <laughs> All right. And she did say she did learn something. Yay. We I learned something. Bits and, and yeah, using bits and pieces, the pertinent stuff, depending on the query. Absolutely. Yeah. Yep. All right. So it doesn't look like any other last-minute questions have come in. Um, if you do have anything you want to know, there's Amanda's email. It's on the slide. It's on the website. You can find all of us at the commission very easily. That's true. We have online presence. We do. Yeah. Yes, we are. Yeah, we're, whether we wanted to or not. Yeah. <laughs> all right. <clears throat> so did, did, did anybody seem to have any desperately urgent questions they need to ask right now? That's fine. You can reach out to Amanda when you are and use all these resources too. Um, so I think we'll wrap it up for today's show. And let's see here. Let this go. I think it's good here. Type in Encompass Live. I'm going to show you our where our website is. And at the moment, whenever you use the Googles to search Encompass Live, we are the only thing that comes up. Nobody ever named anything else this because there's our main web page here um, where we have our upcoming shows. You see what we've got scheduled for the next couple of months. Um, and our archives are right here, archived in Compass Live sessions right underneath the list of upcoming shows. And this is where you'll see a list of all the shows we previously had and links to their archives. It's the most recent one to the top of the list, when, so it goes back chronologically. And you will have here, there will be, this was last week's, um, I think it was not appropriate <laughs> or related. Um, the previous one, a link to the recording, which goes up onto our, as I mentioned um, before the show, to the Nebraska Library Commission's YouTube channel. Um, the slides and the handout will each have a, hand, a link to those as well. So you have access to them um, afterwards. Probably later this afternoon, depending on how um, cooperative YouTube and GoToWebinar is with, um, 
processing the archives um, I'll have available to you and I will send everyone who attended today and everyone registered for today's show we get an email sent to you and then we post it onto our social media Twitter Facebook um, letting people know that the archive is available to you I'll let you know here this is as I mentioned earlier we do have archives here they are searchable um, what did I look for before oh fair use Thank you, fair use um, and you can see we do have done a few things. A few things for fair use came up, but this is the most recent one we did. If you're looking into more into that, the facets of fair use, just done um, August of last year, 2017. So pretty up to date. Um, our archives here are actually going all the way back to the very beginning of the show. If you scroll all the way down, we started the show in January 2009. So this is our 10th year of Encompass Live. Wow. Yeah. Um, but everything you'll find archives going all the way back. And if we scroll a little faster here, 2016, 2015, be aware when you're looking at a previous show what the date that it was actually broadcast live. There will be old information on here, outdated information, superseded. Um, but pay attention to the date. Everything has a date so you know when it actually happened. Um, we are librarians, we archive things. That's what we do, and so we will always have this information up there, but just be aware when you're looking at our archives how old something may be. So that is where our recording will go. Um, I hope you'll join us next week. Oh, we are also on Facebook, I didn't mention that. Um, and come slide to the Facebook page. If you are a big Facebook user, give us a like over there. And um, we post notices of when the show is coming up. Here's a reminder to log in today's show, when an archive is available, is ready. Is this one here? Yeah, the recording of this week's show was available. So if you are big into using Facebook, give us a like and you'll be notified over there when things are happening. So next week, I hope you join us. Our topic is letters about literature. Read, be inspired, and inspired. Inspired. I <laughs> got Halloween in the brain. Right back. Uh, letters about literature is a program where students can write to authors, um, living or dead, who have um, influenced them. And we're um, the program. I think November 1st is when it opens up, so um, that's tomorrow. But next week, we'll have our show on explaining about that. Um, Tessa Terry, our communications coordinator, will be here, along with staff from um, libraries in Nebraska that work with us. This is a program across all the, the whole country. It's not specific to Nebraska. It's done by the Library of Congress. So um, if you are interested in running this in your community, um, watch next week's show to see how to do it. Um, and you see we've got all of our other shows here coming up. I've got a few more dates I'm filling in, so keep an eye on the schedule. Other than that, that wraps up for today. Thank you very much for joining me today, Amanda. Have a good Halloween. And thank you everyone for being with here, here with us this morning. And we'll hopefully see you next time on Encompass Live. Bye-bye.